Ron Lee was born in 1941 in New York and earned a 1963 bachelor's degree in philosophy from Reed College in Portland, Oregon. He earned an MA in demography from Berkeley four years later and then completed a PhD in economics at Harvard in 1971. He spent a postdoctoral year at ENED in Paris and then joined the economics department at the University of Michigan. In 1983, he moved to Berkeley to supervise the graduate training program in demography there and a decade later became the chair of the demography department when it was resurrected after more than a decade in limbo. He recently retired from Berkeley and is now a professor emeritus there. Sripad Tulja Prakar, known simply as Tulja to his friends and colleagues, is the Morrison Professor of Population Studies and a faculty member in the Biology Department at Stanford University. He has published several studies about aging populations, but his main research interest centers on mathematical models of population life cycles, with humans featuring as only one of many species that he studies. This article emerged from conversations between Lee and Tolja at the monthly Stanberg dinners that take place in San Francisco, where demographers from Stanford and Berkeley get together to share ideas and enjoy an evening out. It reflects mainly Lee's work on how population aging affects the solvency of our social security system, with more and more people surviving to older and older ages. Cars start their analytic journey on what should be familiar terrain for us by now. When we consider how the age composition of a population is affected as a country passes through the demographic transition, we already know that we can pretty much forget about the effects of immigration on age structure. We also know what Lee and Tolja Prakar describe as the well-established finding that lower birth rates always make a population older. But in this article, they are not concerned with countries that are still working their way through the early stages of the demographic transition. They are talking about countries like Germany, Japan, and particularly the United States, where birth and death rates already are low and the aging effects of fertility decline are already built into the age distributions of these countries. It is worth pointing out right from the start that this entire article is based on a very specific, somewhat artificial, what-if scenario for such societies. Throughout their analysis, there is no consideration at all of any changes in birth rates, they assume constant birth rates indefinitely into the future. They also assume that in their model of population processes, no migration at all is taking place. Solutions like the Japanese idea of importing young caregivers for older people lie completely outside the frame that Lee and Tolja Prakar set up for this analysis. They want to refocus our attention on the fact that in such societies, mortality as well as fertility should be considered when we're worrying about future developments in age composition and the social and economic consequences that automatically flow from such developments. So the only one of the three determinants of age structure that they allow to vary in their models is mortality. The other demographic components of change are frozen in place for the duration of the article. They then consider in detail the important point first clarified for us by Ansley Cole many years earlier, that falling death rates sometimes can, rates sometimes can make a population younger, but at other times can make a population older. Here they explain exactly why these different results can happen. First, as they point out for us, if we look at any population with a fixed birth rate, to take that factor out of the picture, Falling death rates widen the gap between birth and death rates and so increase the growth rate. This tends to make populations younger. When death rates begin to fall from very high levels that we find before the start of any demographic transition, most of the deaths that are prevented are deaths of infants and young children. Again, as Cole pointed out, all these additional surviving children then increase the relative size of the population at young ages which lowers the average age and makes the population younger. On the other hand, since the children whose lives are saved eventually grow up and reach older ages, any improvements we make in survival at those older ages applies also to these survivors from younger ages, multiplying the effect of such lower death rates in later life. Such improvements in survival at older ages tend to make the population older. We knew this much already from Cole's earlier work. But Lee and Tolja Prakar present this important idea from a fresh angle. They document explicitly what we have inferred more indirectly from Cole's discussion of what makes a population older or younger, 
different stages of mortality decline tend to involve different causes of death. And these causes tend to affect different age groups as the mortality decline moves forward. In particular, they cite many studies to show that in populations that start with high mortality, the first effect dominates when mortality declines. This first effect is the saving of babies and the resulting acceleration of the population growth rate. Consequently, they say, populations become younger. The kinds of contagious, contagious diseases that are easiest to prevent, such as diarrheal diseases, malaria, and other bacterial infections, can be combated simply by better sanitation, better nutrition for children, and relatively inexpensive programs of medical treatment such as mass inoculations. These diseases that used to cause so many deaths primarily struck down infants and little children. So when high mortality first begins to decline as a result of such basic health policies and progress, their survival makes the population younger. This early transition effect of mortality decline is not what Lee and Tolja Prakar are interested in. In the United States, as they point out, progress in saving children from contagious disease mortality already has gone about as far as it can go. Some minor progress may occur from time to time, but this will not have any further serious impact on the age structure of the population. Instead, they are interested primarily in the kinds of mortality improvements that typically come along when countries have mostly completed their demographic transition of both mortality and fertility decline. This involves the other second effect of mortality decline that they described earlier, saving lives by making progress against diabetes, heart disease, cancer, stroke, and other causes of death that mainly kill older people. In countries with low mortality, like the United States, they say, the second effect dominates, making populations older. The scenarios that Lee and Tolja Prakar proceed to explain in detail, then, are set up within a very carefully defined, limited framework designed to focus mainly on the effects of progress against mortality that tends to save more lives at older ages, and that shifts the age distribution more towards such older ages. Since Lee is an accomplished economist, all of this attention to setting up this very specific framework only provides a backdrop, we might say, for the economic analysis that the authors then paint into the foreground of the picture. You may say that it is unrealistic to pretend that birth rates will remain constant for several decades into the future, and even more unrealistic to pretend that no net migration into the country is taking place. But a thought experiment like this where such complications are kept out of the picture temporarily, is valuable because it allows us to isolate quite precisely that there are costs involved in saving lives. Everybody's in favor of saving lives, but the people whose lives are saved then go on living, creating a future that is different from what would have happened if they had not been saved. Sometimes keeping these people in the picture has a happy ending in economic terms, but at other times, although these survivors then are themselves almost certainly always glad that they're still alive, their presence creates new issues for society as a whole that turns out to be quite important. We turn to some of these new issues next. Called by Lee and Tolja Burkar presents a very different picture from any of the purely demographic charts we usually examine in the study of populations. While demographers get to deal with the same subject matter as popular novels or espionage, that is, travel, sex, and death, it is the economists who get to deal with money. And figure one is about money, specifically about how much money people make and how much money they spend. Based on patterns observed in the United States in 1987, the solid line in the figure shows that people incur consumption expenses throughout their lives. From birth through the oldest considered ages, everybody has to eat, Everybody needs clothes to wear or roof to sleep under and all kinds of other goods and services. The calculations that produce this age profile of consumption prorate major expenses like cars and houses over the time that people are consuming them by driving them around and living in them. So it's a fairly smooth curve that starts out at slightly lower levels in childhood and accelerates to the full expenses of an adult lifestyle by about age 50. The main point of this consumption curve is that it cruises along at, at a substantial level over the entire age range from birth to death. In contrast, the dotted line shows the age profile of labor earnings. 
we ought to stop and recognize at this point that the authors are looking only at these labor earnings. They do not consider how much money people in the top 1% of the population are piling up at each age as returns on their inherited wealth and other investments. They're not looking at corporate profits either, just money people earn from their own work efforts as wages or salaries. Since we have laws against child labor in the United States, obviously these earnings are approximately zero for the population up to ages in the mid-teens, when some people start getting part-time or even full-time jobs for the first time. But labor earnings shoot upward along the dotted line very fast after that, reaching a peak for people in their 40s and 50s and then declining gradually again in old age to return to approximately zero on average in the population beyond age 80. All back down to zero really emphasizes that they're looking at labor earnings only, since especially at older ages, income from sources other than work, such as annuities, rents, and other returns on investments become more and more important. But the reason why they look only at labor earnings is quite simple. Such earnings are increasingly the main source of government revenue in the form of income and social security taxes, as corporations increasingly are escaping this tax burden and shifting it to individuals who are unlucky enough not to be able to incorporate themselves and their work. The combination of these two curves, one for consumption and the other for earnings, shows us three clearly different periods of life that should seem familiar from other contexts. First, the period of life up to the point sometime just beyond age 20 on average appears as a dependent stage when people are consuming more than they earn. In the middle, during the working ages, earnings greatly exceed consumption expenses. At least we hope this is true for the society on average or else we're all in a lot of trouble. Finally, at the older retirement ages, we see earnings dip back down below consumption costs, creating what we should recognize as the period of elderly dependence. In the tightly controlled artificial model that Lee and Tolja Prakar have constructed here, they also do not allow any kind of deficit spending. They introduce what they call a lifetime budget constraint. That means that the total amount of money spent, equal to the area under the consumption curve, must equal the total amount of money earned, equal to the area under the earnings curve. For one particular individual, this means we're ignoring any question of salting away some of the earnings as investments to pass down to grandchildren. Everything that gets earned eventually gets spent, and nothing can be spent unless it is earned, either ahead of time as money in your pocket, or after the fact in the form of debts that you have to work off once you take them on. For this one individual, this presents a nice balanced picture. But if we start thinking about a whole population of people, millions of them at all different ages, we have to multiply both the earnings and the consumption at each age by the number of people at that age. And these two products of earnings times earners and consumption times consumers is what has to balance out for the population as a whole. In a high mortality country, when we're saving mainly young people and making the population younger, we're adding people to the left side of this diagram. Some of, the, some of the added years that see survivors will live are spent as young dependents, but they then move on and also add more surviving years in the working ages, usually earning more than what their added consumption had cost as children. So those early stages of the demographic transition will add more earners and consumers at the younger ages. Will the book still balance when we do this? Lee and Tulja Prakar estimate that in fact, saving young lives and adding more people at those ages will actually increase earnings more than it increases consumption. As they put it, this increased survival at young ages will loosen the budget constraint and allow more consumption, otherwise known as a higher material standard of living. Things are quite the opposite in countries like the United States though. In such a low mortality country, where lives are mostly being saved at older ages, we still save a few lives during the working ages and add more earners to the picture. But these earners then grow older and cross over into the elderly consumer population. What is more, we're saving lives even more successfully at the oldest ages, where people generally consume more than they earn, and these survivors never go back to rejoin the labor force later in their lives. So adding survivors at the older ages tightens the budget constraint. 
It adds consumers faster than it adds earners, and the only way to balance the books in this situation is either to earn more or to consume less. The authors never consider the idea of consuming less, although this may be a very real prospect that many of us have to face in our own old age in coming decades. They only estimate how much more people would have to earn in order to balance the books for the population as a whole. To show us this unbalanced situation in the United States, Lee and Tulja Prakar boiled down the comparison of the earnings and consumption curves in figure one to a single solid line in figure two. This net earnings curve subtracts the earnings curve minus the consumption curve from figure one. Where the result is negative, net earnings are below zero. Where it's positive, more earnings and consumption, net earnings are above zero. Superimposed on this lifetime net earnings curve, they plot a dotted line showing the ages at which people are living additional years of life due to survival increases. The area between the horizontal zero line and this dotted curve shows how many of the added years are being lived as young dependents, working age earners, and older dependents. Clearly, most of the years are being lived as older dependents. The additional survivors added to the working ages increases net earnings in the population. This is good. It loosens the lifetime budget constraint and allows a higher standard of living. The additional survivors added to the dependent ages, on the other hand, increase net consumption. This is bad. It tightens the lifetime budget constraint and dictates a lower standard of living. Since most of the additional years of life lived by all these survivors get lived at older ages, the net consumption effect outweighs the net earnings effect in American society. The more lives we save, the worse off we become in terms of the lifetime budget constraint because the ranks of the elderly consumers are growing faster than any other population group. Somebody's going to have to pay all those additional bills. Yes, we're looking at you. We turn next to the specific calculations made by the authors to find out how much all of this is going to cost you. Models from Lee and Tulja Prakar to our own futures, it is difficult to keep in mind all the artificial assumptions and limitations they placed on their careful and precise calculations. Faced with the complex realities of spiraling health care costs, the roulette wheel of investment possibilities for our savings, and the like, we have to remember that in their model, birth rates remain constant, there is no immigration, consumption costs, including housing, health care, and so on, are also constant, and we as a country can only spend what we earn. All of these are untrue, and on top of everything else, there's the question of accumulated wealth that can be inherited in very unequal portions by members of the population. But try to cleanse your mind of all these features of the real world and come along with Lee and Tulja Prakar on this abstracted journey into their model. According to their calculations, since most of each year of life added to the life expectancy in the United States consists of years lived in old age, each such added year of life means that people on average will have to increase their lifetime earnings by about eight-tenths of one percent. This doesn't sound too bad, does it? But remember that life expectancy is not going to increase by just one year. This is the amount our earnings have to increase on average per each added year of life expectancy. If we gain 10 such years, earnings have to increase by 8% to keep up with the added costs of all those new years of elderly life. So how should we manage that? Notice again that their model never considers that we might have to decrease our standard of living in old age by a similar amount for every year of life gained. They explore only the extra amount of work that would be needed to keep benefits level in old age. One way to increase productivity would be to keep earning the same amount in terms of average hourly wages, but to add more hours of work. Not very popular, perhaps, for people who already have their eyes on the clock, the clock every afternoon at quitting time. But for each extra year of life expectancy, we could add about 19 minutes of work per week and still come out even with all those old people on the books. Of course, if we gain 10 years of life expectancy, this turn into more than three extra hours of work every week. Maybe we better just forget about that one. Another possibility, and this is the one recommended by a presidential blue ribbon commission on pension reform convened over 40 years ago, is to extend the normal age of retirement. 
If you move the retirement age from 65 to 67 or even older, you create a win-win-lose situation. The first win is that the labor force remains larger longer. People keep on earning wages and salaries for a couple of extra years, during which time they're paying taxes into the system and also not drawing any benefits that they would have collected in the past. So this inflates the denominator of the dependency ratio and loosens the lifetime budget constraint. At the same time, the second win is that these older workers only start collecting benefits at the new older age, and in the meantime, some of them have died off. So there are fewer people left to demand benefits. These people are starting their benefit payments at older ages, too, so they won't be around quite as long to pile up successive years of benefit income. This shrinks the numerator of the dependency ratio and again loosens the lifetime budget constraint. These are the two wins. More person years spent working, fewer person years spent collecting benefits. Lee and Tolja Prakar estimate that for every added year of life expectancy, we would need to retire on average four months later, one year for every three years of gains in life expectancy. At that rate, moving retirement age from 65 to 70 would cover about 15 years of added life expectancy and still keep the lifetime budget constraint in balance. This option is so powerful that it was actually chosen by the federal government several decades ago and enacted into law. People retiring today are already facing a normal retirement age approaching 67 instead of the 65 that used to be the finish line. It is highly unlikely that this will be the end of the story either. You definitely should not plan to retire before age 70. By the time you get to that stage of life, the normal retirement age should at least have reached that point. If we go back and look at when the original retirement age was set at 65 in the 1930s, there was a reason for that finish line. It coincided with the life expectancy of U.S. men at that point. In other words, people had a 50-50 chance of reaching retirement. The ones who never made it, like my own father who died at 59 after paying into the system all his life and never collecting a penny, subsidized the other half of the population who did make it past 65. Since more women survive past age 65 than do men, and more whites survive than do blacks, Social Security is also a gigantic income transfer mechanism, shifting money from working age men to older women, and from working age black Americans to older white Americans. But how many additional years of life expectancy should we plan for? For most of their paper, Lee and Tolja Prakar rely on official projected estimates of life expectancy from the Office of the Actuary in the Social Security Administration. But it turns out at the end of this article that they have a serious objection to those estimates. According to the Office of the Actuary's estimates, life expectancy in the United States is projected to rise to almost 81 years per person on average by the year 2070, a date most of you will live to see. To get a sense of this estimate, we can plot the actual values of life expectancy every decade in the United States from the beginning of the 20th century through 2010. These values rise from just below 50 years of life on average in 1900 to the high 70s by the early 21st century, a gain of more than 25 years in just over 100 years of history. This fits well with estimates in other studies that suggest that life expectancy has been increasing about a fourth of a year every year for at least two centuries now. This rate of increase is really good news for you and me individually, because it means that every time we finish a calendar year, we've only used up three-fourths of a year of our expected lifetime. We live 12 months, and we gain three months of life expectancy, so we've used up only nine months of expected lifetime. The point of this whole article, though, is that this good news for each of us translates into bad news for the economy and the society, and ultimately a kind of bad news for each of us as well if we're going to have to work several years longer to pay our bills and so on. If we refuse to work longer and insist on retiring at the normal time, and this doesn't change in the future, then either the whole Social Security system will run out of money and collapse, or we will have to increase the FICA withholdings from our paychecks, which goes directly to pay old age survivors and disability insurance payments, also known as Social Security, to your grandmother somewhere. And this is just the official estimate. 
on the chart is represented by a red dot at 81 years. You will note immediately that this dot is not at the end of a straight line fitted through the last century of life expectancy figures. It is well below that point. This is because the office of the actuary, based on expert opinion, believes that gains in life expectancy are slowing down, that the curve in the figure is not a straight line, but is curving over and flattening out. They estimate that it will continue to flatten out and end up at the red dot by 2070. We have seen some signs lately that this may happen, too. But what if they're wrong? If they are wrong, then obviously they are lowballing the estimate of how much money we will need to pay for more and more old people. Lee and Tulja Prakar present an alternative estimate developed by Ron Lee himself and Larry Carter at the University of Oregon that fits the straight line through the existing blue points of life expectancy from the last century and runs it out to 2070. This time we end up at the green dot on the chart instead, and this represents a life expectancy of 87 years, not 81. Six extra years of life expectancy. Two additional years that you will have to work. If life expectancy goes from about 75 to 87 by 2070, that's a total of 12 extra years of expected life. If you have to work an extra third of a year for every three years gained, that's at least four more years of working life. And there you are, retiring at age 70 or so. So get used to it. If we refuse to shift to later ages at retirement, we would have to increase our FICA withholdings out of every one of our paychecks to 24% of total income. Can you imagine the squealing that would produce? Of course, all of this may just be an imaginary exercise. We may not do any of these things since that would mean more government spending. The alternative, of course, is to reduce consumption in old age. So you might also get ready for your parents to come and move in with you when they get old. And you might see some other old people out behind your house, going through your garbage for scraps of food like they used to do in the 1920s when income inequality was also at a historical high point in the United States. Good luck with that future, eh?